Hello everyone, good evening from uh, Sheba Medical Center in the heart of Israel. I want to welcome the South African colleagues on our special webinar this evening. Uh, first, let me say a few things. First, I want to thank my um, panel colleagues, Professor Eyal Zimlichman, Professor Eyal Leshem, Steve Wallace, who sits every time next to me and will coordinate and, and moderate uh, this webinar. I would also like to thank uh, Adam Devine from AnyVision and Tom O'Malley from Early Sense who will join us later. Um, I would like also to thank Naomi Adar, our Executive Director of Shiba Friends in South Africa. And uh, last but not least, our dearest ambassador to the state of Israel, Leo Kainan. And with this uh, words, I would ask the ambassador Kainan to say a few words to um, the people at the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yo. It's good to see you again. I'm happy to see, can you hear me? Yes, of course. I'm happy to see that after such a hectic couple of or three months, you look the same. Um, so thank you for inviting me to open this uh, Shiba Medical webinar said, about innovation in the battle against COVID-19. Um, and let me share with you just for uh, an opening in words, just my opinion about uh, how to, how we address and how we need to address maybe this very chaotic and special uh, situation that is uh, following us for the last few, few weeks. As I see it, there are two, two levels with addressing the issue of the corona, uh, of the COVID-19. The first one is, is the domestic one, uh, meaning I don't remember any other time where it looks like it's almost every nation, every country to itself. Um, each country has its own character, population, climate, health system, and they all need to, uh, has a huge, huge effort in order to contain it firstly domestically, internally in their country. But even though that it's an individual effort, uh, there are still a possibility to learn from each country experience. Uh, and by that to, especially in South Africa, it's an opportunity because the COVID-19 arrived here a bit later than Israel and elsewhere in the world. So that's a good opportunity to learn from the Israeli experience, especially since we succeeded in Israel to do what we call to flatten the curve. Uh, we are even in a situation where we are now having experiences and thoughts about reopening our society. So if we are talking about here in South Africa about stage three and reopening slowly the society, there is a lot to learn from the Israeli experience on that as well. And of course about how we did flatten the curve in Israel. And having said that, I, don't, I cannot think about a better partner and someone to hear the experience than the Sheba Medical Center, uh, as Sheba was the first hospital in Israel to arrange a special area only for the COVID-19 patient, as Sheba was one of the leading uh, hospitals in Israel for other solutions. And there is no wonder that the Israeli government chose the, the grounds of, of Sheba Hospital uh, in order to open their, our situation room, our national situation room, where all the entities and the, uh, and the different um, uh, bodies in Israel were coordinating their activity together. So it's important to hear the Shiba experience because we now enter in South Africa, uh, the uh, time where the numbers are reaching their peak and high, uh, and maybe that would be valuable to hear that. So this is the first level, which is a domestic fight of each country, but still each country should, should and can learn from other countries' experience and then adapt it to its specific circumstances and situation. And Israel can help South Africa a lot, and Sheba is an important element in that. 
The second thing, the second level of how we fight the COVID-19, I think is about the future. Uh, and that is going to be not a domestic effort of each country for itself. That should be a global effort, uh, starting, of course, from how we get vaccines and other, uh, improving other elements in, in emergency health and, uh, and ventilators and etc. So th this brings us to the level of not the traditional effort to do that. This brings us to the level that we um, that we need innovation. Innovation, uh, only innovation will solve the situation of COVID-19. If we won't find solution in that area, I, uh, my personal uh, guess is that it's going to stay with us for a very long time. Uh, and when you talk globally and when you talk innovation, then both Israel and the Shiva Center are leader, leaders in that, in that aspect and area. I don't need to repeat about the Israeli uh, capability in, in innovation. We do miracles there. And uh, I also uh, was very much impressed to see how Sheba is now a leading, uh, a leading hospital, not only in Israel, but acknowledged also by Newsweek as one of the top uh, 10 hospitals in the world. And I was impressed to see how you are having now a hub for innovation inside the hospital and all that, that all elements can sit together and find solution. And what's more relevant than finding a solution to the COVID-19 with all the challenges that it's put ahead of us. So here, also domestically, the experience that Israel and Sheba had in order to flatten the curve, but also the future, how this global and all the countries are joining together in order to get innovation lead the solution to this situation. Otherwise, it will stay here for, for many more months with us. So let me uh, congratulate. First, thank you, Nomi, and thank you all for inviting me to open uh, this webinar. Uh, I, I want to use the opportunity to apologize as well that I will not be able to stay long, not too long, uh, but I look forward for, to hear whatever you have to say. Thank you. From mankind's biggest challenges have come our biggest advances. The unity and speed of how the world responds to threat has left a legacy of breakthroughs that have made life easier, healthier, and safer. New threats to our safety call for us to rethink how we move through the world, how we connect with one another, and how we protect what's important. Computer vision has helped us interpret the world, and now it helps us ensure its safety. The risk of surface contact and the need to control who goes where calls for touchless access control that uses face recognition to open secure points of entry. Heightened perimeter risk and the need for accurate contact tracing calls for automated watchlist alerting with privacy protection. Securely moving services from physical spaces to personal devices calls for remote authentication and verification. AnyVision provides these capabilities, each born of the same world-class research, ethical rigor, and proven artificial intelligence technology. As we work towards a new normal, the quick adoption by leading organizations of AI-driven computer vision will ensure a safer, better protected and more connected world. Good evening, everyone. You just got a taste of one of the technologies that we will speak about tonight that has been integrated uh, into uh, Sheba Medical Center. Uh, as part of the battle against COVID-19. Uh, I first would like to introduce our two panelists tonight, uh, Ayal, Professor Ayal Leshem and Dr. Ayal Zimlichman, who will take us through the whole battle of COVID-19 that uh, I believe that we have battled COVID-19 to a draw at this point, but the war is not far from over. So let's start with Professor Ayal Leshem, please. Yeah. Um, good evening. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure to speak with a South African crowd. I had the opportunity to work in South Africa with the National Institute of Communicable Diseases in Johannesburg, investigating an, another viral outbreak 
when I was on my fellowship at the CDC in Atlanta, and I'm well familiar with the public health capacity and the medical capacity of, of a, a South African uh, medical community. Um, I think the purpose of this, uh, we have about 10, 15 minutes to, for some questions and answers, and, and uh, um, we received some questions in advance. Um, and uh, I think we'll be happy to receive any additional questions on the chat. If there's anything that's, that's uh, more relevant, I will uh, let Steve interrupt and add. I think um, just to give you a brief um, understanding of what's happening in Israel, we've had um, a substantial wave of coronavirus um, uh, disease round about March to April totaling a little bit over 17,000 cases, which led to complete lockdown, uh, closure of, of schools, workplaces. All this lasted roughly two months, and we've seen a, a, a rapid decrease from a peak of hundreds of cases a day to a, a nadir of a, a handful of cases a day. And now, as Israel has completely reopened, with the one exception of mass events, we are back to full activities of workplaces, schools, most public transportation, etc. We're see, we're now experiencing a resurgence of disease. We're seeing uh, on the last over the last few days, we've seen um, about a hundred cases a day. Most outbreaks are around the schools. These are middle schools and high schools where we're seeing uh, dozens of cases in several foci, and uh, uh, the public health authorities are re responding to that. That is on the, on the national or on the global level. Right here in Sheba, we've treated about uh, 500 cases, um, roughly 100 severe cases. So we, we were the largest treatment center in Israel, and we've gathered most experience. We've um, started several coronavirus intensive care units and used uh, extensive technological means, which you will hear uh, a lot about later, to treat these patients and to protect staff. And uh, we can say we've had a relatively good success rate with uh, treating patients and uh, salvaging uh, even very severe cases. Um, so I'll start with the first question that, that keeps coming up on every forum I, I answer, and then I will let Steve uh, pick it up from there and, and bring up some more questions that we received over the mail or from, over the, mail or from the chat. So the first question I, I'm, I'm constantly asked is, are we expecting a second wave? And what's the impact of weather? Because Israel is entering summer now, what's the impact of weather on this virus? So um, a, a second wave is anticipated as long as we don't have a vaccine. A recent study that did a serological survey in Israel found out that about only about 2% of the Israeli population got infected with this virus, which means roughly 98% or 97% are still susceptible. So we are really at point zero in terms of how many of us have got infected and have immunity. Unless we have a vaccine, if the virus is reintroduced in the right conditions and we don't take the right public health measures, we will see a second wave, but that may not happen during the summer for several reasons. First of all, it seems that this virus is a little bit less transmissible, um, less transmissible on cold, dry air. Um, uh, so during summer, it may be a little bit less transmissible. During summer, schools are on break, so uh, there are less person-to-person uh, uh, -person communications. Many people take a break from work, so there's less transmission. And we have adopted some uh, behavioral changes that uh, reduce the transmission. This includes uh, wearing masks during uh, uh, stay in public places and the uh, hand washing and not going to public places when you are ill or have a temperature. Uh, so the bottom line is we do expect to uh, see some flare-ups, some local outbreaks in schools, everywhere where there is person-to-person -person contact. And, uh, and uh, we know that some people that are asymptomatic may transmit the virus. We can still see local outbreaks and some level of transmission. But if we are expecting a second wave, it may happen later during fall or even winter. And the, the most challenging part of it will be that it will coincide with our uh, uh, yearly or annual uh, influenza outbreak. 
which means uh, many persons, many hundreds of people show up at hospital and, and in clinics every day with uh, respiratory symptoms and a fever and can be very difficult to differentiate COVID patients from flu patients, even if they test negative for COVID. So I'll, I'll let Steve pick it up from here and see what, what other questions are interesting for our crowd. I'll shoot another question back at you before we uh, let uh, Ayal Zimlichman actually show people how we attack this virus from a technological point of view. Uh, one of the uh, questions I've been asked uh, is that, is COVID-19 viral or is it bacterial? Well, well, viruses and bacteria are very different creatures and COVID is definitely a virus. It belongs to a family of viruses, of coronaviruses, of which six are known to, to infect humans for cause a mild cold or common cold, a little bit uh, sneeze, some runny nose, and that's it in healthy people. The other two that were familiar prior to the outbreak of COVID-19 were SARS and MERS. Both of them cause severe disease in humans. However, SARS um, completely disappeared in 2003. Nobody really knows why. Probably very effective uh, public health measures and a uh, a, a little bit less communicable than COVID-19. MERS is still circulating, however, much less infective than, than uh, COVID-19. Over. Um, oh, the there wasn't a second question. So it is viral, yeah. It is, so it is viral. Uh, one more quick question for you. Uh, regarding uh, the fact that you know, South Africa is dealing with a, a mega wave. Uh, right now, yesterday, the statistics said 32,700 cases, uh, 683 plus deaths. What did we do differently here in, in dealing with this? And Ayal Zimlichman will, of course, talk about the telemedicine part. But do you think that uh, there's a different mentality in the way we approach dealing with national disasters like this as opposed to uh, other diseases that we deal with here and other countries that have been dealing with the coronavirus. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, we don't want to compare South Africa to Israel. Israel has a population of 10 million. South Africa is uh, 50 million, so five times. So South Africa still has a much smaller population. However, some regions of South Africa do suffer from poverty, um, KwaZulu-Natal or in other regions have very high rates of immune compromised persons, persons living with HIV, which is a different population. So it's, it's very difficult to compare our situation with the situation in South Africa. However, I will say, as I mentioned earlier, that I'm well familiar with the public health uh, and the, the uh, authorities and the National Institute for Communicable Diseases. And my hope is that, the, that uh, South Africa will be able to learn from the, from the lessons that, were, were, uh, that other countries have taught us and implement these basic public health, very cheap, simple public health measures to control the outbreak spread, which are, you know, where, where there's a substantial increase in cases, you really want to enter lockdown, you want to monitor the disease locally and identify these um, foci, foci of outbreaks, and if there's a, a rapid increase that's national, then really enter a, a, a curfew of a few, a couple of weeks, which will enable the disease to die down. Um, otherwise, the medical system in South Africa will be overwhelmed as it was in, in richer countries. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Leshem, for mm -hmm. your insights. I'd like to move to Dr. Ayal Zimlichman, who basically uh, created the, the ultimate uh, innovation center here in Israel, the ARC Innovation Center. And within the ARC Innovation Center, was the uh, dawn of the telemedicine program, which basically uh, created a lot of buzz around the world uh, for its unique battle against the COVID-19 uh, virus. And so Ayal, if you want to uh, take our, our friends in South Africa through what we call a COVID-19 battle, ARC style, the floor is yours. Thank you, Steve. Um, and um, I do want to sh use the next uh, 20 minutes or so to run through some of the innovation that uh, we've started here at Sheba during the COVID-19 uh, uh, period here in Israel. Um, 
I will start with a few words uh, about Sheba Medical Center, just to make sure everybody who's on and knows uh, a, a few facts about Sheba. Sheba is uh, the largest hospital in Israel. It's also the largest in the Middle East. Um, it's large by any international standards. It has about 2,000 beds, which is how we measure the size of a hospital. Uh, 150 different buildings, 24,000 cars that come in every day. We see about 1.6 million patients every year. So the numbers really uh, are talking about a very large institution, not just in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, the uh, operational capacity, also in terms of our physical capacity, as you see here in this photo, it's all on one campus, which is quite a big campus on the outskirts of Tel Aviv. Um, in terms of quality, Sheba was voted uh, this year, just a few months ago by Newsweek, as the number nine hospital in the world. This is a great achievement we're very much proud about. It's the second year actually, because Newsweek started um, um, ranking hospitals just in 2019. We came in as number 10 last year, and we went up a spot to number nine this year. And Newsweek has been, have been looking at a lot of, uh, um, of metrics, including quality, uh, research, and also innovation, which is what I'm going to share with you right now. Um, at Chiba, we have our ARC uh, innovation program. A few words about ARC. Uh, ARC has started, was started about three years ago, uh, but we, we officially launched it uh, only six months ago in a large uh, uh, event we had here in Israel. And ARC is based on four uh, principles. The first one is a focus on digital health, understanding that digital health is going to transform healthcare as we know it. Uh, we're looking to drive that change by the year 2030. That's the ultimate goal of ARC. And we think we have a substantial chance of, of changing medicine within a span of 10 years. And digital health is going to be able to take us there. Number two is open innovation, working uh, with the industry, working with startup companies, breaking down the silos, providing a startup friendly environment for the uh, leading startup companies here in Israel and from around the world that come into ARC to uh, uh, go through an acceleration of development that is not seen in other locations. Third is international collaborations. We're working in an international ecosystem. ARC has about 40 different organizations that are part of ARC. You'll see them in a second. Uh, and they constitute uh, the uh, ARC ecosystem, which we think has that chance of changing healthcare within the next 10 years. And finally, it's about the innovation infrastructure that is needed. Uh, physical infrastructure, but as well uh, data infrastructure and the regulation infrastructure that enables us to fast track innovation in the pace that it needs to, it needs to work. Typically, we focus on these six different areas at ARC uh, on day to day, from personalized medicine to big, big data and artificial intelligence to virtual reality and augmented reality, the operating room of the future, telemedicine, and rehabilitation. We call them hubs. These are the six ARC hubs that we focus on on day to day. Each one of those hubs has an annual uh, plan, has a budget, has uh, milestones that they need to reach. There's a, an arc direct, there's a hub director, uh, they have a conference every year and so on. And that ensures that we have the, the right activities to take us to where we need to be 10 years from now. When we talk about the ARC ecosystem, these are all the organizations that are part of ARC. It's not just about Sheba. Sheba might be at the center of this, but we're talking about international collaborations with the leading academic medical centers from around the world, corporate strategic partners, small companies like Microsoft and Baxter and Boston Scientific and Johnson and Johnson and others, uh, the leading startup companies and the academia here in Israel that work very closely with us. So together, this ecosystem is what's going to reshape healthcare as we know it. Something happened to us uh, towards the second half of February. We started seeing our first COVID patients and uh, we went into this new uh, environment, which was completely strange to us. Nobody thought that we would be the, in this new environment and it took us all by surprise. The first question we had to ask ourselves was, is innovation essential or non-essentials in times of crisis? And it took us about seven minutes to make that decision that innovation is not only essential, but is critical if we are to win this war against COVID-19. Uh, we actually declared battle mode in our innovation program. And if you look at the top left corner of the slide, you'll see the new logo that we've put forward only for this COVID-19 uh, battle, our ARC battle mode COVID-19. We basically took all of our innovation capacity, um, which is quite extensive, and focused it specifically on solutions for COVID-19. And we came up with this new game plan, as you see here on the slide, 
looking at what would be data discoveries that could help us understand more about this disease, ventilation solutions. We all know there was an issue with ventilation and the uh, uh, lack of ventilators in many countries, diagnostics, telemedicine, which of course uh, plays a major role, therapeutics, of course, and also mobile health to help us provide solutions for this pandemic. This was our new game plan. This is where we were focused at. And I'll give you some examples of what was the work we've been doing. And all of this was done during about three months from the beginning of March through March, April, and May to this point where we are currently. I'll start with uh, telemedicine. When we came, uh, when we had our first patients come in, I think the ambassador mentioned this before, we had, uh, we've built a compound just outside of Sheba, about a mile outside of Sheba. And this compound housed the first patients that came in. We wanted to isolate them from the rest of the patients that were of course uh, uh, negative for the virus. The ability for us to do this was to try and utilize telemedicine solutions and technologies to be able to distance the staff from the patients and still be able to take care of those patients and provide them with a high level of quality of healthcare. Uh, we put this technology and we came up with this teletent, which is where the clinical staff sat. You see here in this photo, caring for patients that were many, maybe 20, 30 meters away um, in uh, separate rooms. We use different technologies. One of them is this technology from a company called EarlySense, which you're going to hear more about later on. EarlySense is a technology that was existing before. It's not new for COVID-19. It was uh, here uh, with us for about 10 and even more years. It's a technology that a sensor is placed under the mattress and is able to measure vital signs from the patient without touching the patient, allowing us to continuously monitor patients and then have an AI algorithm that allows us to learn from this data that we're picking up from patients, the, the vital signs, specifically respiration rate, which was very important for us with COVID patients. And this AI, the artificial intelligence application, gives us a notice when a patient is about to deteriorate. This was critical for us. That is why we reached out to this technology. We've used them in other uh, general floors here, uh, medical floors in, at Chiba, but now we've utilized them towards COVID-19. This was one technology we've used. Another one was TitoCare, a technology that uh, we basically uh, have, used, have been using in houses of patients. This is a technology that allows doctors to examine patients who are at home while the doctors are in the clinic. And doctors are able to listen to the heart and lungs. Doctors are, doctors are able to look down the throat or into the ear or look at skin lesions all from miles away or even thousands of miles away. There's no uh, barrier to the distance, of course. And what we've done is we've used the title care technology, again, uh, built to be used at home for this facility, allowing us to have the doctors examine patients without being in the room with them mm -hmm. and having the patients exposed to the virus and maybe to contracting the virus. You see here an example of Dr. Gadi Segal, who is the head of one of our, of our corona units, who is examining a patient, listening to the heart and lungs through the headphones, uh, as you see on, the, on, the, on this photo, and looking into a throat uh, on a screen. Um, this is something new for doctors who are used to being at the bedside, examining patients with a stethoscope, rather than being away. But this new situation required new solutions to allow us to not expose our staff to uh, the risk of being uh, contracting the virus. We also use different robots. You see here one example of the uh, in-touch telepresence robot that allows uh, basically a health professional to uh, maneuver the, the robot inside an ICU facility or a general facility, as you see in this photo and then examine the patient, talk with the patient, communicate and so on. And we've been using that a lot, again, to minimize contact, uh, unnecessary contact between the staff and the patients. We even came up with this new approach of saying, let's build this zero touch telemedicine toolkit that we could apply, whether it's inside a corona unit or at home for patients who are hospitalized at home with a mild condition. Uh, this has a solution to monitor patients like early sense, to perform physical examination like a technology I've mentioned with TitoCare and to manage the patient with a platform we're using uh, with a company called Datos. We put all of that in a comprehensive toolkit uh, and we're allowing that toolkit to be transferred to the home and uh, deployed at the home level uh, so that we could hospitalize patients at home and care from the, for them 
from the hospital. And with that, uh, we, allow, we prevent patients from actually needing to come to the hospital and being hospitalized so we don't clog hospitals with too many patients and allow hospitals to have the capacity to treat the patients that will be more severe and will be required to be in a hospital environment. Ventilation solutions, I talked about that as well. Ventilation solutions, uh, as you've seen some of those photos, and uh, this is an incredible story. Within a span of about four weeks, we worked together with a secret uh, unit in the Army, in the Intelligence Corps in the Army, uh, a unit of engineers to devise a ventilator machine from a BPAP, which is a non-invasive uh, um, non uh, device, to an invasive ventilator uh, that we then took all the way through regulation, patenting, licensing, and manufacturing. And so this ventilator today is available, and we've uh, used about 100 of these uh, with our patients here at Chiba. Uh, this is the photo you see here on the bottom right of this slide. We've had other applications that were devised in a very short while. Again, this was all done in a matter of weeks. Um, other solutions that provided us with uh, solutions for ventilations, um, because we were afraid we will run out of ventilators, as you know, this has happened in some countries and is something we need to worry about when we're treating a pandemic like uh, COVID-19. Next is the tele-ICU technology. We've built an ICU here at Chiba, an 80-bed ICU, in a matter of 72 hours inside one of our parking garages underground. It was an incredible feat, you have to uh, agree, within 72 hours to build this. But it wasn't just uh, the 80-bed ICU. It was also the high technology and sophisticated technology we've used to make this one of the most advanced ICUs on the planet, using robots, using communication technologies. I don't have time to take you through all these examples, but of course we could uh, uh, go through all of that, building a control center within the ICU where staff can work without the protective gear, as you see here on this one of those photos, and, and take care of the patients. And finally, working with artificial intelligence to be able to know what we're predicting for our patients, which patients will not do fine with ventilation, which patients will need uh, dialysis later on, all predictive analytics done through Clue, which is one of the companies we worked with who just uh, validated a COVID-19 artificial intelligence solution. And by the way, they're in line for, for congratulations because they just received FDA approval for that just uh, about a week ago, uh, devised here at Chiba with our data. We used virtual reality. This is the most advanced virtual reality and augmented reality solution on the planet. It's the Microsoft HoloLens 2. It just came out recently, and Shiba was the first hospital in the world to use this technology. We've used it for many uh, use cases, also for remote teaching, where you need to teach uh, uh, somebody who's inside um, a, a, um, a COVID uh, unit and remote guidance. For example, if somebody needs to manipulate a ventilator or some other technology, you have somebody who guides them through the virtual reality glasses, through the HoloLens, and that has been incredible. Microsoft was very much happy with the level of, uh, of uh, interaction we've had with this, um, with this new technology. Uh, Steve mentioned uh, uh, before this, um, AnyVision, one of the companies we worked with, AnyVision is a company that came up with a solution for other purposes. What they were doing is using artificial intelligence on video footage on surveillance cameras to identify faces. This was uh, originally developed for defense uh, um, solutions. Any of you that have seen the uh, FAUDA, the, uh, the uh, um, show on Netflix, have seen this technology in use. We have actually utilized the same technology, the artificial intelligence with facial recognition, to be able to identify contacts within the hospital for a possible transmission of the virus. And I'll give you a short example. If we have a staff member who uh, was tested positive, we wanna be able to understand who was else in contact with that staff member. What other staff members were in contact with him, spoke together, ate together lunch, uh, and could have contracted the virus. Instead of doing the inquiry manually where we have infectious disease nurses, perform this over 48 hours. It's not an easy task to perform this type of investigation. We are now using artificial intelligence that within seconds identifies to us, as you see here on the right side of the screen, 
all the people that have been in contact with that index patient who was found to be positive. That saves us a lot of time in identifying patients who potentially might have contracted the virus and need to go into isolation or to be tested for the virus. We're using it for other applications as well, but I think I'll leave it at that and maybe you'll hear more from the company later on. We've done a lot of work with data. We've actually brought up all of the data from COVID patients at Chiba, and you've heard before that Chiba was the largest hospital to treat the largest number of patients here in Israel. Um, we've taken all the data, huge amounts of data, and uploaded that data to the cloud, and then reached out to all the magnificent data teams we have here in Israel, and offered them free access to the cloud to work on the data. The reason we've done that was this is a new disease as you all understand. And there's so much still we need to understand about this disease. If we have data groups here in Israel that are really one of the most innovative in the world that can help us uh, gain some more insight about this disease, then why not present them with the opportunity to help uh, with that? And we've had about 25 different data groups, all very, very high level, that worked on top of our data in the cloud together with some of our clinicians who provided them with the clinical guidance. And by the way, on the 11th of uh, June, and you're all invited, you'll find uh, the invitations on Facebook and LinkedIn. On the 11th of June, we're holding the final event, which is the hackathon. Um, the, the final five groups that made it to the finals are going to present their findings. It's an open event. We invite everybody to join us and we're going to declare the winner and the winner were actually going to implement their solution on the platforms, the, the computer platforms here at Chiba, so that they actually get the chance to save lives, which is what they all ha have set out to do uh, from the get-go um, two or three months ago. Uh, this is very unique data initiative that has not been done elsewhere in the world, uh, and we're very much optimistic about the outcomes from this initiative. Um, and finally, just to sum everything up, the ARC strategy, I didn't mention this, that ARC stands for Accelerate, Redesign, and Collaborate, Accelerate Innovation to Redesign Healthcare by Collaborating with Partners. And I think I've showed you uh, quite nicely in these examples in a very short while that we were able to accelerate development manyfold, come up with a ventilator within four weeks is incredible. It typically takes years and years to develop. Redesigning completely how we approach things like our approach to zero touch uh, with new technology and collaborating with many different uh, organizations, also from the defense industry, also from the IDF. Um, you know, these organizations we haven't been working with on day to day, but it's times of crisis that bring us all together. And that's what's very nice about Israel and really take advantage of what we have working so well for us on both the defense industry, the medical industry and other industries as well. And just to finalize, this is where we see um, this going forward. This is our six hubs at ARC, and we see Corona becoming our seventh hub. Uh, we're not stopping to work on Corona, uh, even though, um, you know, after we'll be done with this pandemic. There'll always be other pandemics, as we can imagine, and we want to be uh, sure that next time we're not caught off guard and we have the right solutions for the world to help us combat future pandemics as well. So ARC is going to open ARC Corona, and we're going to continue to come up with more innovations that will help us uh, win our war against the viruses of the future. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Ayala. I would have to say that very quickly what uh, this has done, not only uh, changed the way we deal with viruses and uh, through telemedicine and everything, you mentioned 2030. I think in the last three months, we've jumped from 2020 to 2030 in a matter, in the blink of an eye. So I thank you very much, Ayala, and I hope that everyone uh, got an eyeful, so to speak. And with that, as you saw the, the opening video, we have with us uh, Adam Devine. Adam, are you there? We'd like for you to speak for uh, three, four minutes about the AnyVision uh, breakthrough technology that we're using here at Sheba. Uh, that has been very successful so far. Adam, are you there? Adam, if you're not there, we're not there. Okay. 
Uh, so then let's jump to the next technology. We're going to show a video of the other technology that we're using here called Early Sense. No, that's any vision, Early Sense. At Early Sense, we are focused on developing medical technology that helps healthcare providers save patients' lives by providing them with earlier indication than other forms of monitoring of a potential adverse event. The Early Sense system has been used in hospitals, post acute facilities, nursing homes, detox treatment centers, and other currently unmonitored medical institutions throughout the world for the proactive recognition and intervention of clinical deterioration, falls, and pressure injuries. Facilities using the Early Sense system throughout the United States have reported improvements in clinical outcomes. The FDA cleared Early Sense system is comprised of several components, beginning with the sensor. The early sense sensor is placed underneath the patient's mattress, between the mattress and the bed frame, or in an in-room chair. The system does not require any leads or wires to be attached to the patient. The sensor is able to continuously monitor heart rate, beats per minute, respiratory rate, breaths per minute, and motion, with clinically proven accuracy as compared to industry gold standards. Early Sense offers two bedside unit options for facilities, the Early Sense 2 and the Insight. The Early Sense 2 monitor has a touch screen display showing the patient's clinical parameters, alerts, trends in the room with optional continuous SpO2 monitoring capability. The Insight system does not have a screen in the room, but collects the same information. All of the clinical data is sent and monitored at the central display station, CDS. A patient's clinical parameters and trends can be viewed by opening the patient's profile at the CDS. The CDS displays all patients' current heart rate, respiratory rate, motion, bed status, as well as alerts and notifications. Alerts are displayed on the Early Sense 2 touchscreen and its indicating lights, while alerts are displayed on Insight through the various LED lights. Alerts are also displayed on the CDS and can also be sent to handheld devices such as phones, pagers, or tablets to ensure timely intervention. By default, there are no audible alerts in the patient's room. All of the data collected from the Early Sense system is organized into daily reports, which provide insight into the overall health of the patients, patient turn verifications, as well as response times by clinical staff. For more on the Early Sense system, visit earlysense.com. So, uh, Dr. Zimmelman, take us through uh, how AnyVision and Early Sense uh, played an integral, if not a dynamic, role in dealing with the uh, battle against Corona. So, um, you know, I mentioned uh, both of them before, but I'll give some more information that I think, you know, if we have the time uh, to dive a, d a deeper dive. Um, when we talk about um, any vision, for example, you know, we understand today that artificial intelligence on top of video is going to play a critical role in many of our day-to-day of our -day lives and healthcare is not different in, as we look into the future. One of the ca use cases is specifically relevant for COVID-19. Uh, we needed one thing, as I mentioned before, was to be able to perform much better investigations into, uh, into these events where we have a patient or a staff member who's positive for the virus. And obviously we know that they were in contact with others um, in the hospital. Uh, sometimes we would ask uh, a whole department, uh, the staff of a whole department to go into isolation because one staff member was tested positive and we don't know who exactly was in contact with that staff member. Now, instead of sending 50, 60, 100 people into isolation and of course losing them in the battlefield as the soldiers in healthcare, now we're able to use the AI to perform very um, um, accurate investigations and really understand what maybe 10 people or 15 staff members who actually were in contact that need to go into, into isolation. It's that sophisticated that it actually allows us to even understand and, and, and set the time of the contact and the distance of the contact. So do we want the two people who we, uh, to be a, a meter and a half away, two meters away, three meters away? What do we call contact? And how long do they need to be together? Two minutes, five minutes, 15 minutes. So we can set the AI for these parameters and then get the exact information on that. The second thing we're using AnyVision for 
is to alert us if somebody who's coming into the hospital or coming into a unit doesn't have his mask on. So what we've developed with AnyVision is a solution that, you know, using a, just a normal camera uh, that is placed uh, opposite the entrance, we're able to alert if a patient or somebody, a staff, a patient, uh, a family a relative, uh, a guest is coming through the door without his mask properly on. It actually works even when you, ju when you just have the nose out and the mouth covered, it would alert you that this is not properly weared. And so this is uh, something we're utilizing now to make sure the hospital is safe, that the staff don't forget to put their masks on, and same goes for visitors and guests who come into Sheba. And I think this is what we're going to be seeing a lot of in the future, uh, also outside of hospitals, whether it's in shopping malls, in stores, in airports, where we know masks now are critical to be worn around, and uh, we're going to need this technology to help us make sure that happens. So this is um, any vision. Jumping from that to early sense and why we thought early sense is a perfect choice to help us uh, with uh, the COVID patients. As you all know, and you probably read and know about this already, the COVID-19 disease, most of the time is a very mild disease. Uh, most of the time it's even asymptomatic. There are no symptoms. We don't know that a patient is a patient even. But for most patients, it's, asymptom it's mild symptoms, flu-like symptoms, you know, we cough, we have fever, uh, maybe runny nose, something that, uh, you know, if we have that and we're told it's, it's Corona, it's COVID, we say, well, that's, that's all. So this is uh, what people have been talking about. But if that was the case, we wouldn't be so concerned with the disease. The major problem is that some of these patients tend to deteriorate. And when they do deteriorate, deterioration is very rapid. So they can go from a very mild flu-like disease to a life-threatening condition in a matter of hours. And what changes first with these patients is respiration rate, number of breaths per minute. And we needed a technology that allows us to monitor breath per minute on patients and to be as non-obtrusive as possible. If we could do this without touching the patient, so the patient is not even aware that respiration rate is being measured, then this would have been the perfect solution. Of course, we knew about early sense from before, we worked with Early Sense here at Chiba. We did the initial validations for the device back in 2008 when the technology first came out. Uh, and since then, Early Sense has been around in many hospitals, mostly in the US, but also other countries in Europe. Uh, we knew that th this technology is able to do exactly that. Measure very, very accurately respiration rate and heart rate and also motion from the patient while the patient is in bed through a very, um, very um, special sensor that is placed under the mattress and is able to measure all of that without touching the patient. Quite an incredible Israeli technology. And with the, with the years, early sense have gathered more and more data from patients that were monitored and was able to develop an artificial intelligence application that was able to predict hours before when a patient was about to deteriorate inside a hospital. Typically, with, before COVID, it was uh, something like sepsis or something like a, a, a bleeding inside the body after operation or some other complications we see in hospitals. But with COVID, we were assured uh, and we believed in that, that the technology would also be able to pick up deterioration for these COVID patients that turn very rapidly from being a mild case to a moderate and a severe case within a matter of hours. So we've had all of the beds in our COVID units being monitored with the early sense device. All the data stream into our um, control center, as you've seen in some of those photos where we had the clinical staff observe the data and be able to alert uh, for those patients that the, that the AI, the artificial intelligence decided that are about to deteriorate. We found that very, very useful. When we got those alerts on those patients, we knew it was time to transfer the patient to the intensive care unit for COVID. And this was what we've done with the 400 patients or so we've seen here at Chiba and we've treated. We're collecting the data. We're now uh, building and improving the artificial intelligence solution to be very specific for COVID. Uh, as I said, right now, it's, uh, it's uh, applicable to all conditions, but we wanted to be even more specific for COVID. And we think this new technology 
that will be coming out now specific for COVID will play a central role in many places around the world to help in exactly what we've done. We've also taken it to another level and that was to the home. Again, think about this very mild case at home. Everything seems fine. Maybe some fever, maybe some cough, nothing out of the ordinary. But then the early sense device placed under the mattress at home is now, monit is now alerting us in the hospital as we monitor those patients in the hospital at home environment that something is about to happen. And if we do get a sense that something is happening, that the respiration rate is starting to uh, climb, that other, um, other um, uh, vital signs are starting to change, it is at that time that we want to send an ambulance over to the home of the patient, pick up the patient and bring him to the hospital to make sure that if deterioration actually happens, we have him in the best conditions possible to care for him and also uh, save his life if he goes into this uh, life-threatening uh, condition. Um, and this is what, how we've used early sense, both in the hospital, but also outside of the hospital as part of our telemedicine corona kit, together with the other technologies you've seen in uh, my presentation. And, and we think this has a, a critical role to play in the um, um, maybe years to come as we confront um, condition like COVID and maybe others in the future. Well, that's exactly the, one of the main questions uh, that was sent to us and also the things that, that we've been dealing with here is that mm -hmm. the telemedicine programs existed uh, before Corona. Uh, a lot of people don't know that Shiva was the first hospital in the world to start integrating uh, home care with telemedicine for psychiatric patients at home, for mild uh, psychiatric patients. So the bottom line is, is that telemedicine has jumped five years ahead, at least. What happens in the post-corona era and telemedicine and doctors, how will telemedicine change the relationship between doctors and their patients? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, we, um, when we look at the COVID-19 crisis, it's obviously a crisis, don't get me wrong, but with every crisis, there are opportunities, as we know. And I tend to look at this as the quarter filled glass. I wouldn't say half filled glass uh, because it is a tragedy what we're seeing around the world right now, but there is a quarter uh, filled glass. And part of that is telemedicine. Telemedicine has really sprung forward. Um, and we might be looking at this historically when we, uh, when we are years away from, from, from 2020, uh, when we look back to actually say that COVID-19 has really been uh, a, watershed, a watershed event uh, to really change the tide on telemedicine. What we have seen right now, doctors that now have no other opportunity, they have no chance. They have to use telemedicine because patients can't come to them or because they want to minimize the contact with the patient. These doctors that before were, um, weren't very comfortable with this technology, you know, they were saying, I cannot examine a patient who is in his home and I'm in my clinic. I have to be at the bedside, uh, or I cannot examine a patient who's on the screen and I'm in my clinic because I have to have the physical contact. We're seeing many of these doctors now understand that it can be done. You can provide high level of care, high quality of care to these patients through telemedicine technology. And also patients got to be very much more comfortable with this type of technology. So as we transition out of COVID, and hopefully that happens very soon, we're going to see telemedicine stay with us. It's not gonna go away because both clinical staff and patients found that it, it is something that helps us. It is something that uh, can provide high level of care. It's not something that is a limitation and, and a necessity like times of COVID, but it is the new type of medicine. And we're saying that maybe 2020 is the year that telemedicine becomes just medicine. That's the transition we're going to see. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Joel? Yes, and uh, with this word, I want to conclude our uh, webinar this afternoon from Shiba. I want to thank uh, again my colleagues at the panel, Dr. Real Zimlichman and Dr. Mm -hmm. Professor Real Leshem. Of course, Steve, my uh, first Colleague. and second hand, <laughs> but always standing beside me and uh, moderating this webinar. I want to thank our colleagues from the Shiba apps around the globe that's staying with us uh, for this webinar. 
I want to thank uh, Rabbi David Cho, which I show I saw him uh, previously listening to our uh, webinar. The great Nomi Adar, thank you very much for coordinating, arranging uh, this opportunity to speaking to the South African uh, colleagues and friends. And last and not least, uh, Ambassador Lior Kenan for his supportive any, any time. And wish you all of you a um, very good day and Todarba Litraot Shalom.